Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kristen Schilt. I'm the faculty director for the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. And thank you so much for joining us for the inaugural Lauren Berlant Memorial Lecture. Lauren Berlant was a professor in the Department of English here from the early 1980s until their untimely death in 2021. Lauren was a co-founder of the Original Gender Studies Center, which is now this lovely place we are today, and served as a director in the 1990s. The author of myriad books that defined and founded key concepts in gender and queer theory, including The Queen of America Goes to Washington City, Cruel Optimism, and posthumously, On the Inconvenience of Other People, Lauren was a dedicated teacher and mentor and a tireless advocate for keeping space open for research and writing that presented what they would say forms of queer we might not yet recognize. When I joined the university as an assistant professor in the social sciences, Lauren loomed large in my imagination of what it would mean to be a real gender studies professor. Um, we shared a lot of space at CSGS events, but never really connected until one day she ran into me carrying a copy of the vegan slow cooker. Uh, she invited me to have a cup of coffee that started a conversation about what's the best way to thicken a vegan bisque and became a 10-year discussion of theory, pedagogy, growing up with narcissistic mothers, and how to survive the academy. I co-taught gender and sexuality theory with Lauren for several years, which opened up my own thinking and let me return to a space of collaborative learning that you often don't get as a faculty member. Like my undergrads, I would find myself writing down in class these brilliant one-liners that Lauren was able to throw off so casually, like one I just found written on an old notebook that said, look, you can solve a Rubik's Cube, but you can't solve the problem of living. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren showed me what it means to make a space for different forms of thought and expression, and how to throw everything you have at feminist and queer world building on campus, and I miss her every day. For several years in the 2010s, Lauren ran the Worlding Writing Project through 3CT and CSGS. The purpose of this project was, in Lauren's own words, quote, to explore new modes of writing and reading, not in an effort to affirm expertise, but to imagine productive idioms for critical engagement and to assemble novel ways of attending to socio-political phenomena. Lauren invited theorists, artists, social scientists, and even stand-up comedians the speaker did a lecture followed by a workshop of their own creation the following Friday. In those Friday sessions, whether I was folding little tiny zines or doing a free writing assignment, I appreciated the chance to work collaboratively with students, faculty, and staff on something that was really outside the everyday life of the university. This annual lecture series, which is a collaboration between the Center and the Department of English and 3CT, hopes to continue Lauren's legacy through the following this format of the Worlding Writing Project. So I'm so excited to introduce our inaugural speaker, Professor Paul Lisicki. Paul is the director of the MFA program at Rutgers University Camden, where he's an associate professor and the editor of Story Quarterly. Paul has received awards from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the James Mishner Copernicus Society, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Providence Town, where he served on the writing committee since the 2000s. Paul is the author of six books, most recently, Later, My Life at the Edge of the World, which came out with Grey Wolf Press. Later, which Paul will be reading from selections from today, is a beautiful lyric memoir of his experiences living in Provincetown in the 1990s as the AIDS crisis devastated the queer community. Uh, if, you didn't, if you don't have the book and you don't know this, the book actually came out on March 17th, 2020. So if we think about what that date means to us. Uh, and I read this book deep into the pandemic, uh, which made it even more of a moving experience. Later has been reviewed in the New York Review of Books, the LA Review of Books, Lit Hub, the Washington Post, and interviews with Paul about the book have appeared in the New York Times and The Believer. Later also topped the chart of the best books of 2020 from NPR and many other outlets. Now, if you have a physical copy of Later, you can see it has gushing blurbs from queer literati, such as Eileen Miles and Garth Greenwell. But if you know anything about me, I always like to read Amazon reviews of people's books. Um, and Later has rave reviews on Amazon, many of, <laughs> you should, many of which were actually written in March 2020 and captured my own feelings about the book, though much more eloquently. So one anonymous reader wrote, here you can feel the pressure and grace in a life that must be lived under such harrowing conditions. I read and reread and catch myself lingering over so many gorgeous observations, while sometimes, which sometimes come at the most challenging times, times that may well prove a parallel to the pandemic world we live in now. Here is beauty, and if we've ever needed beauty, later is now. 
My sister, a writer of queer memoir who is joining us today, introduced me to Paul's work and I immediately saw a spark between his writing and Lauren's Worlding writing project. Um, Paul actually teaches a course called Multi-Genre Experiments in Form that uses intergenre writing uh, work as a touchstone for new writing. And you can read this really beautiful piece he wrote about it in LitHub. When I read that piece, I could imagine the joy that Lauren would take from a passage in this essay where Paul writes, as a queer person, I never knew how to fit very well into externally designated categories, especially when there were only two options for me. I had the feeling I could learn from poets, how they saw, how they heard, it struck me as the art form closest to music, my first love, and I love the fact that poetry has always felt like it was steaming ahead of me and my job was to catch up. So I want to thank Paul in advance for being our inaugural speaker, and as always, I wish Lauren was here to join us. Please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Lissicki. Hey everybody, it's so good to be here. I guess I'm supposed to pin this to yeah, myself. Be able to hear is this upside down? Wait a minute. This is better. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Very good. I don't hear my feedback, so that's, that's, that's an extra pleasure. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, so happy to, um, to see your faces, especially on a day where it, it's beautiful to be outside, so I, I appreciate your presence. I don't, I don't take in-person readings for granted any longer. There was a point in my life not so long ago where I was doing this all the time, and it just, um, I, you know, once the pandemic came along, I didn't realize how much I missed being in community with other people who appreciated um, language and, and thinking and feeling. So this, um, this means a lot to me and I'm happy to be able to share this, the next um, half hour or hour with you all. So I'm gonna read a bit from later and then I'm gonna read some new work and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. So, oh, thank you, thank you, Kristen and Tate and Gina and everyone associated with the center um, for being so welcoming to me and for being in contact with me since last fall. I, I feel like um, you guys did such a terrific job of making me feel included and welcome and I appreciate it. So as Kristen said, um, later is set in the early 1990s in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which probably many of you know is at the tip of Cape Cod. Um, and I was invited there as a fellow of the Fine Arts Work Center and was tremendously excited about my fellowship and knew it was going to change my life because I was going to live in a place um, by the water, which I love dearly, but also in a queer community. I don't think there was any other place that offered two things, um, you know, mutual realms that I knew were going to en enrich me and draw me out. But I really didn't know what was, you know, what was to come. I didn't really, I knew I was gonna be educated, but I didn't know I was gonna be educated in the way I was, so. This is called Circus, just a, a little uh, snapshot of town. Circus, the car climbs the hill and at the top wild space opens up ahead. And there it is rising out of the water like a question, an illusion across marsh and platinum lake. The Pilgrim Monument, a 25 story replica of a tower in Siena. The curved coast of the harbor shining the spray of boxy white cottages along the beachfront, fishing boats, sailboats, boats of all types pinned to the surface like thumbtacks. Up, up Route 6, I've been driving in deepest New England, charming and astringent, or through a version of my childhood woods thick with pitch pines. And from here, it's a tree-shorn city, stranger, because I haven't driven toward a city in hours, not since Fall River, who would ever tell that it's all of three blocks wide, three miles long, a long reclining anaconda of a place? And maybe that's why every attempt to lay it out comes up short. Every representation stretches out into failure. The temptation is to paint it gold and deep green because that's what it stirs up in me, safety, connection, expression. The Provincetown is neither warm nor cold and it's never in between. A simultaneity of masks, a place constantly shifting like the light and the dunes, 
What should I expect of a town built on dunes? This is called Haven. I'm actually skipping through this book and sort of making it a, a new narrative for you all. So if some of you know this book, that, that will explain some of the, the space. Haven, how far has my life been from my body, my breathing, my posture, my silliness, my joy? I stand up straighter, my shoulders fall backward as if they've been held up for too long by pulleys and strings. My walk changes too, or so I imagine. My heels strike the pavement as if I'm possibly damaging my feet. This is what power feels like, but only when power is spread evenly or when queerness isn't othered, but is central. I look at people's faces. People look back at me, not exactly with need, but curiosity. Who are you? And never the stench of judgment. No expressions that say ugly, weak, failure, get out, go back to your country. To be freed from the day-to-day -day expectation that someone's out to kill you. The air alive with released human energy. But how will I ever be able to leave this haven so far from the repression and punishments of adulthood? Am I trapped in sweetness now? This is called three-way. I have never been around so many queers in one place before. Some would use that as a reason to stay single. Why tether yourself to one person when you could spend successive nights with him and him and him and him? I, however, respond to this plethora of men the way I do when looking at the menu of a Greek diner. I point to the veggie burger, slam the menu shut, and push it across the table so I won't be psychically overloaded. <laughs> I'm well aware that one of the reasons I want a boyfriend is to signify to others, particularly through the catwalk that is the main street of town, that I'm lovable. A boyfriend is as much a public pact as a private one. And somehow I have gotten the notion that I need to be with someone else in order to be happy didn't start in town, but someplace earlier where relationships presumed to be a duty of growing up, like buying insurance or a first car. Maybe this comes from growing up near Philadelphia, where single people are usually looked at with caution and concern, and family life is all. So what stance to take on? Or do we not choose our stance, and it is written in our childhoods or in our DNA long before we're in the world? Is a boyfriend someone to love or someone to be loved by? All couples, straight or queer, position themselves along that fault line, though they rarely talk about it. I know how to do the first, but the second part makes me nervous, like an amateur. It silences me, actually. Dogs know how to be loved, but they are rare like that. For humans, it's easier to turn one's eyes to someone else than it is to bear another's eyes on you. Those eyes come with expectation, wanting. Those eyes say, you might leave, so I will grasp onto you and do everything I can to make you feel. As for the possibility of illness being a third party in a relationship, well, imagine waking up one day with new sores on your back, tongue creamy with thrush. You can't even see your way to the bathroom. Your throat hurts. You've been feeling like your old self for weeks, staying up late, none of that dizziness when you get up from the chair, and now you're about to be in a bad patch, which might just be your final stretch. It's a big enough job to take care of yourself. It's already 10 full-time jobs. How could you bear to catch the pain in your boyfriend's eyes, his desire to make things better? Fuck better, you say aloud one day, just to test him, just to hear how it sounds in the air. And he weeps and stomps and tears a painting off the wall, all the while apologizing for his outburst. You want to tell him to go, but he's too lost in you to go. Is obligation murder? Too much to go wrong, too many feelings to be hurt. And the immune system, stress of any kind, suppresses it. So the two of you tend to politeness the way you tend the garden outside the window. The roses thrive. There's no scale or blight on the leaves. But your relationship 
It doesn't die, though you never asked for a three-way with an illness. So at a certain point, I was asked by my friend Mark um, to look in on his partner Wally while Mark was um, commuting to New York City to teach at Columbia and Sarah Lawrence. And um, this is my experience of getting to know Wally and I think being enfolded more deeply into the community. I mean, at this point, I think HIV, AIDS was like less out there, but something that um, felt felt close and um, and life changing. Honestly, to be in proximity to, it's called kenneled. Wally and I know now he isn't going to get up one day and walk down the street. He lies on the couch. I sit across from him, and conversation seems useless after ten minutes. I don't want to be a burden to him, and I don't want him to think he has to take care of me. What is time? I'm learning not to be nervous about having nothing to say, even though I occasionally fill silence with chatter. It would be better for Wally if I weren't nervous. So I sit cross-legged on the floor with Arden, who has grown accustomed to my visits. Arden, by the way, is a dog. I let my hand get lost in the dense, smoky black of his curls, which is as much about soothing me as about soothing him. Occasionally, he gives tender licks to my fingers, as if I'm broiled chicken. Arden must wonder why Wally has stopped taking him for walks, and his confusion around all of that might account for the fact that he's been eating so much. Whenever Wally cannot finish breakfast, he gives it to Arden, and as a result, Arden has swelled to the size of a small household Bruin. The weight puts extra pressure on his hips, his joints. It takes extra effort for him to stand, and he wobbles a bit when he carries himself from one side of the room to the other. I probably don't know how much I am terrified of death, but I'm starting to sit with it. It would be unseemly to even mention any of this to Wally. He has enough on his mind. The only real gift I can give Wally is to pull us both into the here and now when the future is looking at us so loud and scary we can already hear it roar. Wally doesn't want to say too much, or maybe he can't. He might simply want to keep silent so I won't know what he's losing. If he sees me see something lost in him, then maybe there is reason to be scared. Three creatures in stillness in the room, the furnace high, peace in the middle of catastrophe, paying a visit to my friend, Wally. One Wednesday afternoon, I get a phone call from Mark just as I've come in from the gym. There has been some emergency, the absence of any details. He's too rushed to fill me in for now, frightens me. Is Wally okay, I say? Yes, Wally is okay. But there is some medical appointment that possibly involves a hospital stay in Boston. And could I take Arden to the kennel? Arden has been to the kennel many times before. It is said that he feels at home there, so of course. There is no problem getting him into the front seat of the car. He seems perfectly content, a gentleman in the passenger seat, looking out at the pine trees and the Christian motel and the occasional gas station. But his head looks left as soon as I turn onto Nauset Road. Maybe he already smells the poop, the obedience, the fear. Still, he keeps his chivalrous posture. He has too much dignity to whimper or whine. I park, open my door, open his door in order to hook the leash onto his leather collar. He will not move. Even when I try to pick him up by the haunches, he will not move. He has willed himself to weigh 10 cinder blocks. He wants me to get the message. He has put up with enough, enough change, enough with being a good boy, damn it. He is middle-aged and now he is losing his human whom he's been watching out for ever since he was taken into the house. And his devotion isn't even enough to keep him well, to keep him in the world. It will take two people from the kennel to get him out of the car. And when he does move finally, he trots with ease 
as if to shame me in front of these strangers, as if to say, oh, Paul, what was all the fuss about? <laughs> so I think this must have been the fall of 1993. The movie Philadelphia came out, which was a very, very big deal in town. It was the first time um, the subject of HIV and AIDS um, became part of mass entertainment. So um, the whole town, it seemed, came out to an otherwise, uh, what usually was an empty theater in the winter time. And I wanted to read you a section called Hollywood. Has anyone looked at that movie lately? Yeah. Hollywood. Oh, this is my boyfriend at the time, Noah. I think that's all you need to know. Hollywood. Noah and I sit in the left side. That's not his real name, I should say. It's a much more attractive name than... <laughs> Noah, the person known as Noah, has never read the book, thank God, and still... Um, <laughs> he, he comes off usually pretty well here, but he made a decision not to read it, and we're still Instagram friends, and he's, he's very dear. Noah and I sit in the left side of the Wellfleet Cinema, is not so far from the front. Though showtime is almost 20 minutes away, the theater is packed. I've never seen every seat filled, especially in the dead of winter on the Outer Cape. We're here to see Philadelphia, the first big budget movie about AIDS. It has real stars. People whom every bit, everyday people like, Tom Hanks, Denzel Washington, Joanne Woodward, Antonio Banderas. Bruce Springsteen sings its theme song, Streets of Philadelphia. I'm skeptical about it, as I'm skeptical about all things big. Big songs, big novels, big ideas, big countries. All things big have an inborn arrogance to them. As well intended as they might be, they are finally about wealth, accumulating it. And I can smell the machinery that wants to draw people in, that wants them to keep coming back. Big statements aren't for people like us. They're for people who see movies just to talk about movies. On the other hand, it's a relief to be seen Queer people, people with AIDS, survivors, HIV negative people, all of us. How long have we been erased? And if we hadn't been erased, we've been represented as depraved, weak. Not that some of those representations aren't hilarious. Joel Cairo in the Maltese Falcon, Sebastian, and suddenly last summer. Enough. The theater goes dark. I'm watching characters move across the street but thinking more about Noah holding my hand, rotating the knuckle of my thumb with his own. Is there anything more satisfying than having your significant other holding your hand out in public at a movie? Straight people take this for granted, but queer people? We can hardly wait for the lights to go down. And once the movie gets going, the real happiness begins. Noah's hand in mine. But the film is so determined not to offend, not to get things wrong, it's managed to situate itself in a weird in-between place. It, it isn't exactly bad, but I'm watching, the way, I'm watching the way I would watch a documentary about dying dolphins. And I say that loving dolphins, but they're not me. Every time a potential, I'm glad you laughed at that. <laughs> Every time a potentially wrenching exchange happens on the screen, Noah squeezes my hand until it feels like the manual equivalent of Morse code. The movie isn't afraid to say this is the one story of AIDS. No matter longtime companion, no matter brother to brother, no matter the man with night sweats, no matter the body and its dangers, no matter people in trouble. But, and I'm annoyed that it doesn't intuit that there are countless stories that will never make it to the screen, stories of black, Asian, Latino people, stories of women. Hollywood has the power to sear a narrative into the collective imagination, and though I resent that power, what about all those film executives still in the closet? I sit tight and obey. I won't start muttering complaints while I'm still in the theater. <laughs> and then a man stands up halfway through the film, Abruptly, it is a bright scene as the whole theater is illuminated. 
He's crying like a baby, a baby boy, and it wouldn't be so wrenching if he weren't such a tough-looking guy. Leather vest, Levi's, salt and pepper mutton chops. I've often seen him around town, always in his leather bomber jacket and white t-shirt, always too butch to even look in my direction. He can't stand it. Once you represent something, it's real. And up until now, AIDS has only been a horrible dream. Now he knows it's an emergency, and he stands up, weeping. I want to protect him. I want him to stop breaking my heart. I want him to keep crying as nothing up on the screen feels as powerful as this or the absolute discomfort of seeing it, listening to it. He walks out breathless. I don't know whether he's crying for someone lost or for himself or both. Maybe he's crying because he thinks he'll have none of the people once closest to him, his parents, his sister, when he dies, and he must suffer through this well-intended movie that insists every life is of purpose, every life shaped by logic. He has never known such good fortune. And if he should get sick, his friends, his friends, while well-meaning, might turn out to be flakes when they're most needed. They have bailed on him before, and they'll bail on him again. And what should he expect when he's loved them for their spontaneity and quick passion and unreliability? Dependable people, as he knows, are boring people, and he knows what it's like to abandon others too. For a while, I don't see the man at the gym, at the a and or at the coffee house at the Muse. Not that I'm exactly keeping an eye out for him. That's just how it is when disappearance is as routine as breakfast. And one more s passage from this book. Let me check on the time. Yeah, okay, yeah. so I'm going to read some new work, too. Um, so this is called Cumberland Farms. I'm reading you only tender things about Noah. I mean, one of the things that's really at the center <laughs> of this book is that, you know, um, I think fear of HIV really troubled our relationship and troubled lots of relationships, like how to contend with, without um, any notion of the future, like how to make a pact with someone when, for all intents and purposes, you were expected to die by the time you were 40. So this is just, I should say, this without, this is a moment of sweetness in a time of lots of turbulence in that relationship. Does anyone know Cumberland Farms, the New England? Uh, yeah, I thought when, everyone calls it Cumbies in, in Massachusetts. So. Some Cumberland Farms. I don't, Cumberland Farms, for whatever reason, appears in many of my books. And I, it's, it's, it's a mystery. Uh, sometime after nine every night, Noah and I button up our coats and strike out for the Cumberland Farms on Shank Painter Road. We walk up Winthrop Street by the cemetery, the oldest existing burial ground in town, established in 1742. Its inhabitants aren't the newly dead, but the old dead, who know there's been lots of activity in town. Nevertheless, they say, don't forget us. Those of us who've lived long lives, long enough to lose our looks, our usefulness, our power. Not a car or another human in sight. Constellations appear, the Big Dipper, Orion. Darkness behind and ahead of us. Fox dashing into the brush. Once we're inside the house, which feels overlit after all that darkness, we go right to the Pepperidge Farm display and pick up a bag of cookies, cookies named Montauk, Chesapeake, Nantucket. They're likely spiked with preservatives, but it would be absurd to worry about preservatives at the end of the world. We're barely out of the store before we've torn into the bag, devouring them until they are just crumbs in the bag and in the whiskers around our mouths. We laugh about winter weight, but have six months to firm up before Noah is back on the go-go box. The night gets darker on our walk. We reach for each other's frozen hands and rub them warm. And this is why people couple up with each other. So I am working on a book about Joni Mitchell in my life. I was asked of 
I got an invitation. Check your DMs on Twitter. I got an invitation from an editor who had known my work for years and wrote, this was December of 2021. Paul, would you ever be interested in writing a book on Joni Mitchell? And I've tried to play it super cool. Yeah, that's a nice idea. <laughs> and then he, got, he asked who my agent was, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I love him. And then th this, this book started to happen in the next week. So it's not so much about Joni as much as Joni's influence, um, how she's shaped me as a human, as an artist, and, and every other facet of me. So what's behind this is that I met my boyfriend at the same time who, without knowing about the book, started courting me by, he's a, he's a neurologist, but also an amazing singer and, uh, and performer and would start, he courted me by, by singing Joni songs to me and sending me to them. So that's um, what happens in some of this. I'm going to read six pages in from the book so you won't get any sense of his physicality. He does have a body. Um, <laughs> but you're not going to get it here, I don't think. Maybe a little bit at the end. Then I'm going to skip ahead and read a little um, meditative section and then finish up back with Jude. It could have been Woodstock, could have been River. Oh, this is called, the, the book is called The Sky in It. Um, Joni has a lot of sky. That's not something uh, in her work. Um, interesting to think about its role um, from song to song. It could have been Woodstock, could have been River, could have been Night Ride Home, the Magdalene Laundries, the Three Great Stimulants, Cactus Tree, any of the songs that are relatively straightforward, that moved like other people's songs harmonically and melodically. Instead, the first video he sent was Down to You, one of Joni's most demanding, a song she'd rarely done in concert, probably because it was too difficult to make all its independent moving parts sync up at once. He didn't perform it for me. That would come a bit later. Instead, in the span of a minute, he gave a little lecture about its architecture, which wasn't A-A-B-A -A -A, like many popular songs, but A-B-A -A, cadenza A. So much went on in that cadenza, a morphing instrumental passage that took direction from classical and jazz modalities, the bass note rarely acting as the root of the chord. It wasn't the most romantic song. If anything, it was the opposite, in that its narrative considered the inevitable loneliness that came from sex with strangers, with people you might pick up in a bar after you've had some drinks. Joni doesn't overplay that loneliness, though the phrase love is gone punctures the listener. That loss is no longer just personal in the second verse, but societal. A breakdown of connection, a collapse of kindness and warmth, a cautionary take in a collection of songs about freedom, especially sexual freedom. Was he tired? like me, of an ongoing pursuit that seemed significant once, a catching up after being taught by the culture that his sexuality didn't exist, his body didn't exist, and if it did, his longing was depraved, a matter to be policed. Against that, what else was there but to fuck into one's gorgeousness again and again? He knew I was a fan of songwriting, but didn't know that I was a songwriter once that I'd published music in my late teens and early 20s, that I once wanted to write work that approached the intricacy of Joni's music. He didn't yet know that I breathed and drank that desire, that everything else was an obstacle to me. And one day I stopped. Well, if it had been one day, I'd have been kinder to myself and music. A proper morning could have occurred. I could have wrapped music inside a baby blanket sent that basket down the river as the voice inside went silent and disappeared among the reeds. I come to think of my paragraphs as the sweet ghosts of my songs. I was a better writer for pulling in what I knew about phrasing, unexpected chordal leaps, shifts in meter, changes in emotional register, the silence between notes. Every writer should begin with another art form and use that as a point of comparison or departure. 
It was one of the few pronouncements I passed along to my writing students, and it was never a lie. But the way I talked about leaving music behind seemed easy, almost cozy, as if I'd simply knocked out a fireplace, pulled up the rotting floorboards in the kitchen, and basked in the sunlight through the windows around the table. If I decided to think of myself as a writer, I could say, here, I can make something on my own and not have to deal with the complexities of others' egos, the perils that come with collaboration. But it hadn't occurred to me that giving up music was as extreme as moving to the Mojave and giving up water in order to be a better person. I missed the hammering of my fingers, missed taking satisfaction in their strength and reach. I missed worrying about the condition of my voice, whether that granular scratch meant strep throat or whether it was just the season of cedar pollen. I missed the sense of inhabiting my body that music gave me, locking myself in my butt, neck, thighs, and diaphragm in the manner of an athlete. I missed trying to impress someone by simply singing and playing for them, a practice that somehow took on a life of its own in that my ego dissolved and we were water. Music was water. I understood it to be so in that it broke down levels. It equalized. Once anyone was inside music, there wasn't a boss of it. The listener meant as much as the players. And we weren't ourselves anymore, not quite, with our usual heaviness and dashed hopes. If anything, it made us lighter, buoyant. We floated. Why would I do such a thing to myself, my spirit? People give up children. People leave beloved places behind for their families. People step out of their lives in middle age to care for an ailing parent. People leave pleasures behind in order to become activists that help and save others. I gave up the one true thing I had that connected me to people. I'd been lonely as a child and I brought myself closer to others through music by playing with and for them. I saved my life through music. I gave it up. In the 25th month of COVID, I stood in the auditorium of a small college in central Pennsylvania, not far from a twisting river. It was only the second time I'd read from my work in person in 24 months, an activity that used to seem as familiar as the length of my hands. And as I read, it occurred to me that everything I'd ever written was about loss. Young people abandoned by their families, young people dying just as they were coming into being. And if I wasn't writing directly about AIDS, I was writing some figurative version of AIDS. Even when I was writing about my mother's dementia or my friend's year with brain cancer, I was writing about AIDS, the damage it wreaked on love and relationships. It made sense to write about that particular grief given what was happening when I was so young. And it made sense to write about that grief given what was happening now when 300 people were dying every day and so many had reached the point when we were just thrugging, shrugging. We'd had enough. We were throwing away our masks. It took too much to feel. But what kept me lifted through the years? Had my writing gone there except for glimmers? I looked into those students' faces. Queer joy, not simply sex, though a part of it. An appreciation for the absurd, for making fun of the structures that hold government, gender, hierarchy together in the hopes of blowing them down dancing until you knew yourself a part of a, as a part of a unit of other thrashing bodies. Laughter, even if the source of the joke wasn't really all that funny. Queer joy, what Frank O'Hara said of love, the mere presence changes everything like a chemical dropped in paper and all thoughts disappear in a strange, quiet excitement. It was what Jose Munoz called an ideality. We can never touch queerness, he wrote, but we can feel it as the warm horizon imbue imbued with potentiality. Queer joy was the nearest thing I had to religion, though to call it religion nailed it to a wall, connected it to practice, practices that did too much damage, took away its sweet, unruly, ferocious power. It was all too tempting to snap off the soft tissue before it had a chance to grow 
too tempting to harden one's materials, and that it felt like that's what literature asked for, darkness, strictness, understatement, obedience, control. Some of that? All right, but it was never the whole story. It wasn't enough to rely on the same chords, same song shapes. Not enough to use long conversational lines because one had used them before. Time to learn the bassoon. Time to take a long break from a depended upon tuning because I didn't want it to do all the work for me. What did I want? I wanted to write about two men who despised the phone but FaceTimed for five hours straight one early December night until one of their batteries went dead. I wanted to write about one man looking into another man's face and seeing only that face, knowing for the first time that love wasn't distant, unreachable, impossible, doomed. I wanted to write about a, ma about a man whose parents never said, no, you shouldn't laugh like that. You look like a girl when you walk like that. And why would you want to wear those bright orange pants? But let him know. <laughs> a little too excited. <laughs> the orange pants, I know. Obviously wearing orange pants. <laughs> I wanted to write up about a man whose parents never said, no, you shouldn't laugh like that. You look like a girl when you walk like that. And why would you want to wear those bright orange pants? But let him know that their love for him was reliable and deep, not founded in his ability to contort himself to their ideas of what other boys should be. I wanted to write about how that love deepened and nurtured that man throughout his entire life, as well as anyone who felt his touch. A chemical dropped in paper. That, that. Just bear with me for a second, because I'm reading out of order. Uh, never do this. Did it fall off again? Nope. <laughs> Putting it here. Oh. Oh. I'm so sorry. It's like, a, like a, a, I've become a flaky poet. They always do stuff like that. It's like part of the, part of the show. Okay. Deep breath. This is the final the final passage before we move to Q&A. Jude looked right into the camera as if he were looking into my face, even though to do so, he had to be looking fully at himself, unafraid. With only two percussive notes on the piano, I knew he taught himself lesson in survival for me. And as I listened to his turns, holds, and spaces, I heard it as a brand new thing, both of Joni and not. His playing wasn't so much about his ability to get it right, to win it, but to show me all the intricacies that lay inside what I thought I already knew, every detail that was too easy to miss, the song cracking open into a fresh field that wasn't simply one thing, but an oncoming action of colors, stems, petals, and leaves, both browning and coming to life at once. See that violet, that yellow, Shepherd's needle, fire wheel, bog torch, button bush, chicory, cinnamon fern. Maybe I'd never really loved. And if I didn't crash into his arms like the speaker in Amelia, I felt them around, him, around me, holding me in place. It was staggering to know that about myself after all this time, which only made me want to hold him harder. And now it's just beginning my life. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions about this work or, hey, you know what I was, I meant, I screwed up. I meant to read from this book of, of Lauren's at the beginning. So I'm just, if, I'm just gonna read, yeah, it's Encore. So a little bit, this is the book, I'm sure some of you know this, The Hundreds. So I, I'm just gonna read, you have to start somewhere, which I think is a good place, a good coda. You have to start somewhere. I dreamed I was emptying the blue glass vases we bought for her memorial service at the Elks Lodge. 
I had learned long ago, following her around like a duck, that cleaning up was how you stacked a day or the labor of carrying on. But now I was alone in a panicked, hollow act, and I knew it. The flowers in the vases were brightly surreal, like plastic, but bloated too, like a swollen cabbage patch doll face or a generative bacterial load blooming into a state of indistinction. Then I was leaving her house. We had to go. We had to leave the little dog behind. I ran back in to put the laundry in the dryer, do something with the trash. I had a second thought about the kitchen. I could repaint the shelves, restock, replace tuna fish and lentils with tomatoes and Macintosh apples. The dream flared up at the judgment call. I panned the perimeter of the tree line, scanned the living room hankering at her jade tree, the blue sandwich glass teacups on the windowsills. The front door closed at the other end of the house. It sounded precise, like something momentarily proving true. So I'm happy to answer anything or about writing, about what I read. Provincetown. Yes, sir. This is kind of a craft question. Oh, craft questions are good questions. What is the relationship between you giving up music and the way you write now? Because I think rhythm is, it's always important for any prose stylist, but I really felt the sublimated musicality in your reading, even in the way you read, like when you had to stop, you know, you backed up. You had to kind of start, go through that passage again. How does, how does your, yeah. your musical training come through in the prose? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't think my musical training came into my writing until my third book, and I'm not exactly sure what it was, but one of the, one, the, the speaker in that novel was a speaker who wanted to, to have a life off the page. And in order to write that book, I needed to read it aloud again and again. And if something felt off, false, if I stuttered through a phrase, I knew that was a sign that I had to go back to the work. And um, yeah, it, it felt a little less painful to acknowledge the fact that, oh, I'd found at least some place for my musical training. Um, I think, the, I'm not sure this is in there, the deep truth of the matter is that I really, and I'm not saying this as a joke, I really would love to be a singer, a, a beautiful singer, there is a beautiful singer trapped somewhere inside. <laughs> I'm sure many people can say that, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think I'm that unique in that matter. But um, I just, I, my voice sounds like, my singing voice sounds like soil. And like, I can't, it's just not, it's not, it doesn't, the timbre of it doesn't match what I hear in my head. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I don't really phrase that well. When I, when I try to sing, and, um, but I know what good phrasing is. So it's, this is like, I think the, the musical quality of the prose is really, is really important to me. I want it to sound like a song. I also want it, I mean, I want it to have some density and congestion on the page. So it's like, you know, that you can go back to it and, find other layers of meaning and it just doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't want it just to, to be a transcription of something that's oral. So, but thank you for asking. Yes. Yeah, hi, so I think you must have been referring to Mark Doty, who was your friend, so I just wondered. My ex, yes, oh. yes, <laughs> of 14 years. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love Mark Doty's poetry, um, so just, I, I yeah, he's a character asked. in he's a character in later. Uh, yeah. He's not Noah then. No. <laughs> no was no was that would have been Wally time. Yeah, yeah. Noah was a, a lawyer turned go go boy, which I found so <laughs> endearing at the time he gave up law to yeah, to be yeah, to be a performer, really. Yeah. So I, well the question was meant to be more general. Mm -hmm. um, just that there were a lot of artists. Uh, in Provincetown during this period. This, 
how did how did that work both you know was it a t was it a time you could think about art that you could talk about art together and sort of what sort of influences so I was wondering yeah Dodi is, I mean Dodi is so lush and textured and um, in yeah, way. yeah. A, he's it's a great describer. A great, yes, exactly. a, a huge descriptive right. gifts. Um, so I just wondered, you know, the collision of all these different right. artists trying to make art in the midst of this calamity. Where, where how did that influence? Yeah, that's such a great question. Well, yeah, many people in Provincetown were coming. The people who um, they were artists. People who had been artists came to Provincetown, right. but there were people who um, were you know, late in their lives who, who became, who developed their artistic talents um, while in that place. And it was at that time, there were lots of readings and galleries. And it was, it was very, it was a very, art making was a very central text yeah. to everyday experience and so would you hear something and think oh, I want to try that or oh that's not the way to do it or or it's not that yeah. conscious maybe um maybe to a degree I mean sometimes you'd hear something that's so much crystallized um the tenderness and urgency of a community mm -hmm. and it it felt like it felt religious, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those texts were experienced communally. I mean, there was also a lot of art that wasn't good, whatever that sure. means. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, there was a, I don't want to mean to be reverent about it. I mean, many of us would just sit in, sit in chairs and just go, oh. <laughs> like, but, but like, we're, but also with, you know, there was love alongside that too, yeah, sure. respected it appreciation for someone's need to communicate and touch others so I don't want to sound crass but I also don't want to idealize and romanticize. You know, I, I was in New York in the late 80s and 90s my partner was a um, literary, man, uh, literary manager at Circle Rap which is a very well known off Broadway theater so we were in the theater world so there were lots of artists colliding and, and lots of like really bad art you go see an AIDS play and you, you know, you want, yes, you want to honor the effort, but you also want to blow your brains out, and then you see something <laughs> miraculous. Right, um, right. And, you know, but anyway, certainly everyone there was, felt they were part of some larger collaborative project. Yeah, yeah. That, w that was, so those collaborative, pro I mean, individual artworks, the, the gatherings that happened as part of the presentation of individual artworks. That was tremendously sustaining. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it didn't, it happened in an unbidden way. It wasn't, it, there would be pop-up shows. Yeah, and, up. yeah. Yeah. Up. yeah. Yeah. But there was a lot of irreverence too. I think that often gets a lot of like super dark humor, especially in a place like humor. I mean, like Provincetown, um, that, yeah, dark, Dark humor was was nourishing in an odd way, and, and, and a pressure valve, and yeah, we weren't all very well behaved. <laughs> but that gets elided out of you know out of narratives after some decades. Yeah, there's a kind of sanctification of a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that yeah. wasn't part of that scene. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, a couple of questions, yeah. both of them about time, really. Um, so these events took place in 93 91 to 93. Like, I, th I think the book scope is 91 to 94. And the book comes out in 2020. Yes. So you're presumably writing this stuff, you know, 25 years after the event or so. Yeah, 20, a lot of it, the first draft was 2015. Right. So I guess I'm curious about the, you know, the significance of mm -hmm. the temporal Life. Yeah, and it's a good what question. The, you know what the what the kind of memorial perspective does to the way in which you rendered this, and then yeah. the add-on question to that is: Did you go back and see the movie Philadelphia again? <laughs> I did. I did. And how was that? Um, 
it's like the the movie itself is is very much about um, homophobia from a straight man's perspective, and um, and Denzel Washington changes by the end of the movie. So um, that's that was illuminating. I don't think that was anything. Uh, we could see at the time. I think we were all too close to the movie, and it felt it felt large and confusing. It felt diminishing, and as I said, well intended. But yeah, I had tried to write about Provincetown as a community back in the '90s, like '98, and what I had written was really sentimental. I think it was like, too determinedly tender, and I think. We were all, I was too close to that community at, to, to be a reliable thinker about it. So um, I think I tried another version a few years later and it was better, but I, it, it kept, um, kept scrabbling at me. My father became ill in early 2015 and he was sick for about six months and would go into hospice. We'd all gather around him and say goodbye, and then he'd get better and go back home. <laughs> and it happened three times. And I thought, why is this so traumatizing? What does this remind me of? And literally, maybe four weeks after his death, I started writing. I was lucky enough to get an artist um, colony fellowship, I started writing the book. And so, I, you know, I'm writing, I was writing about that time period, but I think in part it's also fueled by a pretty raw experience of, of grief, a, a confusing experience of grief. I loved my father, but he was a very complicated person. And um, yeah, thanks for asking. Yes, Paige. Um. I wanted to ask about the ways that you use quotation in later, and especially the ways that you quote queer theory. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my favorite parts in the book is where you quote cruel optimism. I do, <laughs> <laughs> which was written much, <laughs> much more recently than 1992. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and the scene that happens right after that. But um, I feel like I learned a lot from how you quote from all these different materials, some of them just like people whose writing is notoriously like dense and theoretical. Um, and um, it felt like you managed to like find quotations that could stand alone, um, mm -hmm. that, weren't, that didn't require a reader to know already. Yeah, yeah. And I was just yeah. kind of like, would love to hear you talk about like how you think about that. In yeah, your that's, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I didn't want, I wanted the book to feel choral. I didn't want it to be a book that was written by just one voice, which was problematic because I thought, as I started this book, I thought, I have no right to tell this story. I know this experience seared me for many years, and it's something I'm still, you know, living, thinking about. But um, I think what happened was this, the the voice of the speaker was diminished in early drafts because I was negotiating with that fear of, I don't, this is, I don't, this is too important for my little life. And my editor said at the time, you know, we, we really want to hear your perspective. We, we, this book wants a rudder. And so that, um, that opened up a lot for me. And I had gathered those those quotations, a lot of those quotations um, had meant a lot to me over the years. I think back in the early 90s, reading queer theory was, was um, it was so sustaining to come across, you know, thinking that I otherwise didn't see in art, you know, in, in creative work. I wanted to make sure that those outside voices weren't just theorists, but there's someone in town who talks about having been a nurse and not knowing whether someone was truly, or she, she draws a distinction between someone being dead and dead dead, which is like 
really typical of, of Provincetown humor at that time because there would be rumors that someone was dead and then you'd see him in the A&P. And so there was like, oh, so, oh, he was just dead, but not dead, dead. And my friend Polly talks about having a run into a couple in a guest house. So I wanted, I, I wanted those voices to come, not just from theorists and academics, but from other spheres as well. It really, when you said you wanted it to be choral, I think that opening where you have like, maybe like six. Oh, right, yeah. Too, like that is such a like, the voices of the past. Yeah, the yeah. Town kind of thing. Yeah, and I wanted them all to, to kind of ring in simultaneity. I didn't want one to stand for more than the other. I just wanted them to be heard together like a, like a chord. Your musical training. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, I think we should, oh, we'll take one yeah. more question. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to tell you all now, we have an amazing vegan reception. Yay. Lauren again. So, um, if you ever got to come to Lauren's event, the vegan receptions were always worth staying for. So we do hope you'll join us after this. Sarah, please. Um, I have a question that's actually very related, and it's a question about loss, going back to what you were saying about having this realization that everything you have, I don't remember at what point, historically, um, yeah. like maybe um, after your, that your first three books or up to that point, everything you had written had been about loss. And I was wondering how you, how you think about, how you inhabited, how you worked with loss in the process of, of later, because um, I, I guess like two pieces that come up for me around loss that I'm really curious about. One is temporal, mm -hmm. um, because in, in reading it, I just have such a like such a peculiar sensation of presentness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like not sifting through something that's memorializing or elegizing, which feels so different. Like feels like it, it just it, it makes me really curious about what it is like to yeah. produce that on the level of craft. Right. And then yeah. along with that. Um, that it's it's not it's not a window into a past that is just lost, although that may also be true factually. Or, um, but also that it doesn't seem as though it, it didn't feel to me as though you were trying to steward a specific loss or a specific lost person. And there are just uh, one one work that I've been spending a lot of time with recently is Paula Vogel's The Baltimore Waltz, but mm -hmm. you know also just many other. Um, testimonial literatures and memoirs that are about a lost loved one um, in the after of that person's death. And I, I was just wondering mm. what that was like for, for you as a voice, as a speaker, um, like, like how you thought about that. Yeah, it, I think my treatment is much more intuitive and it's probably in line with how I experienced that time and those people. For some reason, that particular era from 91 to say like, even beyond the book, 95 to 96, is so crystalline in my imagination and so present. It does not feel like it's a distance of 30, 30 years. And, um, you know, I could say that if I were to ask, if I were asked to write about something from 98 through 2012, that, that's, those years are really hazy to me. So like whatever ended up on the page, I think it's just like hastened by my psychic temperament around that time. I think the present tense um, does a lot. There's something artificial, I think, about that, the, the present tense because it doesn't leave space for um, retrospective, even though there, you can tell there's plenty of built-in retrospective there. It's very sneaky. I, yeah, I wanted to capture a sense of simultaneity, which is, I think, how I experience, I don't know, it's just like how, it feels like how my consciousness works. Um, yeah, I'm not, Youth does not seem very far away, which is like the <laughs> arrogant, <laughs> misguided, uh, vulnerable thing to say, but it, re it really doesn't. And I didn't want to manufacture a distance that I don't experience. I like, so what can I offer this body of work that, that feels true to what I know and feel? Is that, is that specific enough? Yeah. Thanks for your question, your observation. Well, please join me in thanking you. Thank you all.
Thank you. Thank you.